So I, I think um, this is an interesting subject matter, and uh, you can see that uh, I just adopted the the, the main uh, the main um, the main title of the book, but actually the Kenyan chapter actually focused on growth. Uh, economic growth, labor market dynamics, and even the prospects for a demographic transition. But the first thing you notice is that uh, my co-authors, um, we started off as three co-authors, and um, in the process of time, we, it's, I've been orphaned. I'm on, only all alone, so uh, it has been quite a devastating kind of thing that those of my co-authors have uh, passed on. But the most important thing is that they had done all their work by the time uh, this happened. So I thought maybe instead of, uh, because this, I think we presented um, uh, the, 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 the chapters in various, in, in various forums. But the last time I looked at it was 2016 when we were launching the book in, uh, at the Brookings with uh, Borat and um, Fintap. And uh, the interesting bit was um, every question, and I'm sure Rema will come up with that question, is that why the, why, what, is the, what are the distinguishing features of the African lions, and why, why, do we, why did we look at the African lions? And the first thing is, maybe the best thing is actually to look at almost about seven characteristics of these uh, distinguishing features of these African lions. And one of them is that we have observed, and especially in the decade of, from 2000, and this is the period, the period of coverage is 2000 to 2015, but we have observed improved macroeconomic policy environment in most of these countries. And the second thing is that some of them have been driven even by high commodity prices. And of course, there are also uh, resource economies that have really uh, benefited from that. But of course, improving governance and even political accountability has improved in those decades. For us, that's very important distinguishing features. And in some countries, and especially uh, the East African uh, uh, region, especially Kenya, the digital technology has taken over and has, has actually driven some of the sectors in terms of uh, increasing productivity and even try to increase also market access in those uh, sectors. And then the, the, the demographic transition is one big issue because population has been really declined. But in countries like Kenya, for example, you find that the growth in, um, um, in, um, in, in the informal sector is the one that absorbs the labor. And that labor doesn't seem to be quite productive. So essentially, the youth employment and then informal sector growth is also something that we looked at. And then the expanding cities is one of the areas that uh, we can actually look at in terms of the future growth uh, uh, stimulus for these countries. And, and then we have seen that in some of these countries, there has been better targeted social protection. Those were the, like the distinguishing uh, features of these six clients. But then what about the Kenyan case? I tried to bring in some of the characteristics so that they, it gives me a, a chance to spring towards the conclusions that we've made. One of them is, and the, that's the considered position, was that Kenya can use its potential, or should I say, use locational advantage. And it has the potential to use its own locational advantage and even this policy space to spur um, high economic growth via trade and even, even, even trade, trade in, the, in, the, in the regional market. And the second one is that Kenya has been a supplier of FD, FDI for most of the countries in the region. In fact, uh, if you look at, for example, FDI from Kenya to Uganda, Kenya is only second to the UK. And this, those have important uh, characteristics of uh, the regionalism, especially the East African region. And um, then there's the potential for natural resource discoveries. Of course, this is always comes up in the, in, the, in the media, especially when you discover oil and everybody looks at it. It has been quite, and especially uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, gas in Tanzania, oil, and, uh, oil in uh, Uganda and Kenya. The, that potential for resource discoveries is actually very, very crit critical. It can change even the, the, the profile of growth. But the recurring theme in, this, in the paper is that population structure leading to demographic transition can help countries reap the, the demographic dividend. And for this, we have, first of all, we look at the labor market and employment, growth and productivity, and even earnings functions, and what are, do they provide any drivers uh, to economic growth? And of course, what are the supporting policies in agriculture, financial sector, and public investment? And I think the discussion this morning, and even yesterday I've had, is focusing on these areas. And in addition, what are the, support, uh, the, the policies that are likely to support 
these structures, like for example, uh, social protection, or even governance institutions, or even institutions that protect and regulate the market. For us, that is very, very critical. And then, then we focus on uh, wh what exactly is, is quite critical in the Kenyan case. And um, one of the features, especially the sample, 2000, uh, the sample period 2000 to 2015, has been huge investment in terms of macro stability in Kenya. But we also have seen that institutions have strengthened and even aided by legal frameworks, new, new constitution, of course, um, uh, uh, the, the, the most important thing is also having a, a, a vision, a vision 2030 in Kenya, for example, to coordinate even what kind of investment you need to make, what kind of targets do you need to monitor. That is a, like a good coordinating uh, framework. But more importantly, there has been opportunities and challenges that can be overcome, but binding constraints continue to be extremely high. And binding constraints in this case look at um, in infrastructure that imposes a heavy burden to, let's say, manufacturing. Uh, infrastructure that imposes a heavy burden in terms of transactions cost to the private sector. So that is the layout in terms of what the paper has analyzed, uh, uh, the chapter has analyzed. But then maybe the best thing is, instead of having to show what the analysis has done, is the conclusions, what kind of conclusions that uh, we do have. One of the conclusions in the whole totality of the book is that the quality of growth is weak because it is manufacturing absent. And I think uh, that is an, a very important aspect. But the Kenyan case is that the growth faces risk because, because there are so many uh, opportunities that could be used to spur, to spur growth. But what it really has, or what we have, is a problem in terms of savings and investment that can sustain growth in a, uh, for a long period. So what we see is uh, growth episodes in Kenya, and then all of a sudden we have just some threatening uh, growth. And if you look at even the employment, I'll talk about the employment, you find that even when you look at earnings in the informal sector, or even the, should I say, the employment figures, they are not even correlated with economic activity. But you find that employment in the formal sector and even earnings functions, they are correlated with economic activity. So you then see that the informal sector has uh, its own characteristics that are not very, very uh, quite uh, confirmable with what we might think about growth. Of course, I've made this point about uh, taking advantage of, um, it's a point that I, I used to make uh, to in, 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 in seminars in Kenya that actually Kenya doesn't need even to discover oil. It, is, it has a locational advantage that it can coordinate a, a very um, efficient uh, in transit port, transit, sorry, transit airport, efficient port facilities, railway networks, and even road networks, and can serve the region, the East African region. It is capable of serving five rad locked uh, countries uh, which are relatively resource rich, including Ethiopia and South Sudan. But if you look at the costs imposed by the port facilities in Kenya. I remember in the World Bank, they, when they looked at uh, growth in, in, in Uganda, there was always the Mombasa factor. as a negative uh, externality or a negative uh, factor to growth. So it means that I used to argue that you don't even have to struggle to discover all these things. You can be a Dubai for yourself and uh, in, in terms of airport facility or in, in transit airport, you can, be, uh, you can provide a road network to support large countries like Southern Sudan and Ethiopia. Youth unemployment remains very high. It's a social of political stability. But of course, this is also interesting because uh, when we looked at uh, the data, and I also looked at the African uh, Development uh, African Bank uh, uh, African Development Bank data. But un unfortunately, I only have the 2011 data. It shows that actually Kenya has maybe the largest proportion of uh, the middle class, the growing middle class, and that is part of the. African, uh, grow, uh, Africa rising narrative. That is about, in the East African region, using that data 20, 2011, it shows that actually Kenya has about 44% of the middle class uh, and the growing middle class, young and growing middle class. And one of the characteristics about the middle class is, the, is a class of innovators. It is a class of um, very strong uh, entrepreneurs that, that, are, that is upcoming. And that for me is very, very important. Thank you. And of course, the relative uh, population growth, 
this is always a, an interesting one. But the most important thing is that for us, for Kenya to experience what we or to reap the demographic transition, they has to put so many factor, so many policies on, on the plan. It shows that actually the analysis we uh, the analysis and the conclusion shows that Kenya may be likely to reap the uh, the, the dividend by the target year of uh, before by before 2050 as the target period, and that seems quite uh, far, but it's quite consistent with the kind of data that we're seeing. Uh, I talked about the emergency of uh, the, 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 the middle class. But the most important thing I wanted also to show, to argue, and I have argued about the, the, wage, uh, the wage functions, the, even the earning functions. But the most important thing is uh, the insufficient capital accumulation. Why, is the, why does the informal sector seem not even to be, the, the activities in the informal sector, the employment numbers does not seem to be correlated with economic activity. And that is a case where, it, where we, ha, we find that it's perhaps it's a less of your, a reservoir for unemployment or even other employment. But the most important thing is that it may require capital deepening to actually try to align it within the, 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 the growth of the economy. And, um, and hopefully that is going to change in terms of how we see it. And the final, point maybe I want to make on this one is that we have seen a success in terms of other sectors using the digital technology. And one of the successes is about the financial, the financial sector and financial access point, uh, access. We have seen that it is like it can change. It can reorganize the, sec the sectors in terms of even introducing perhaps retail electronic payments that actually help other sectors across the economy. And so we are saying other, other, other sectors of the economy can actually perhaps try to um, um, uh, follow that kind of development. And for us, it's going to be very, very important. But other markets that follow that, and we have seen even studies that are coming up to show that financial inclusion itself in Kenya has lifted about 2% of the population of the households out of uh, poverty. And those are powerful studies because 2% of the households in Kenya works very well into quite a large number of households. It's about 140,000 households. So it, in a sense, it says that we can actually use the examples that have uh, have come up through one sector to actually try to coordinate other sectors. But at the same time, look at the structure. And the problem with the informal sector, uh, I keep going to that, is that the kind of data that we get is survey data. You don't seem to get uh, like annual data that can tell you exactly what is the changing structure. One of the things about the survey data, it shows that when you look at the informal sector establishments, every year, Every year, it is the units that increase, not the existing units expanding. And that is where the dynamics is lost. And that's why we really, one of the conclusions we are making is that capital deepening may change the structure of this informal sector. When you look at government statement, they always say that the informal sector is going to be the mainstay in terms of absorbing labor, in terms of production. But when you look at it in terms of dynamics, it doesn't even show that dynamism. So essentially, it's something that we really may focus on when once data is available. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm running out of time.